Welcome back everyone. It's great to have you here. So today I wanted to discuss a technique that I've been using for the past decade that has helped me to improve my photography and my creativity more than any other technique that I've actually learned. And I've kind of refined and developed this mindset and I'm going to teach you the current stage of development right now. And you can implement this for anything you want to learn or improve upon, but just so happens that it works really well for photography too. So over the last decade or so of teaching people photography and doing photography full time, being out in the wilderness, hiking, taking photos, and kind of learning how I learn best, I've kind of studied myself and I've studied how other people kind of learn. And this is one of the really big things that kind of stands out. And that is that I see a lot of people, and this includes myself, that kind of run away or try to avoid or stay away from or design their life in a way that they can always avoid being uncomfortable. And I found this to be a huge detriment. And by uncomfortable, I mean people try to avoid situations that they don't like mentally, meaning it might cause them mental discomfort, or they try to avoid situations that might bring physical discomfort, such as really hard, physically challenging things or even things that are creative that they know that they would really like to do, but they know that it's a hard process to figure out and get better at. And since their work's currently bad, working to get better can be really uncomfortable. So whenever I'm looking at people that are trying to learn and looking at myself, I always notice this because when I first have this idea pop into my mind of something I want to improve upon or get better at, my mind all automatically just comes up with all these reasons that I'll fail or I won't be able to do it. And at first glance, I might say, okay, well, there's no way I'll be able to do that stuff. So I just revert and kind of stay on the comfortable pathway that I was on. But what I've trained myself to do instead of looking for comfort is to find the areas that really interest me in my life and I want to get better at and then go towards uncomfortable scenarios because what I've found when I actually embrace being uncomfortable and I go towards things that make me uncomfortable physically and mentally, if these are actually things that I want to get better at or improve upon, then the end result is I rarely ever fail at them and I end up enjoying the entire process even though at first glance I thought it was going to be uncomfortable. I enjoy the whole process more. And I just have a way more fulfilling life when I'm always aiming at stuff that is uncomfortable. So I want to talk to you guys today about the process or the methodology that I use to become more creative, become better at photography, and just have a more fulfilling life by always aiming at things that might seem way up here and out of reach and that seem uncomfortable to go after at first, but really end up being just a great overall experience after I determine that I'm going to go for them, even if they do make me uncomfortable in the short term. So that's what today's talk is going to be all about. Any of you guys that are new here, there's a lot of subscribers that have been signing up in the past few weeks, which is awesome. I do these Sunday talks every Sunday that I'm home, and I do a quick talk at first, then I answer some of your questions from the past week, which I'll be doing later. But my overall goal is to be able to teach as many people as possible and kind of show them the paths that have not worked for me over the past decade or so of being a full-time landscape photographer and show all the ways that I failed and from those failures show the mindsets or techniques or different ways of living that have worked for me so you can kind of use those techniques and bypass all the failures. So the best thing that everyone can do if they want to help me to teach more people is to give a thumbs up under the video, subscribe to my channel, you can hit the notification bell. And what this does is it kind of lets Google's algorithm know that you got something out of this video. So by doing any of those things, you let me teach more photographers because the YouTube algorithm says, hey, people like this video, I'm going to recommend it to more people. So Google will show the video to as many people as possible. If you guys keep subscribing, hitting the notification bell, and the like button. And that really helps me out to teach all the photographers I possibly can. Another way you guys can help me out is if you want to sign up for my email list, I send out really cool stuff all the time. I never send spammy stuff or garbage content. I only have to send out things that I really think will help you out. So there's a box 
or a link under this video where you can check out my email list too. But I have a few notes here of the key points that I want to talk about today. But the overall arc of this thing is a technique or a mindset called anti-fragile. You could call it anti-fragility as well. And there's a really good book on this called Anti-Fragile. And it's technical, but it's a great way to view the world. So anti-fragile things are systems. You could say it's a thing or a system. Is anything that can take stress or strain. And from taking stress or strain, it actually improves that thing in the long term. So you could take, for an analogy, something like weightlifting. You go in, you lift some weights, it's a lot of stress and strain on your body, but so long as you recover afterwards, it actually makes your body stronger over time. I'll grab a piece of paper here real quick, and I'll show you guys an example. For example, we'll just put two axes right here. We'll call this one time, and I'll show you something here in a second. And we'll call this one stress strain. All right, so here's the two axes I have. We have time, then we have stress and strain. Now, by this, I don't really mean stress like, yeah, you're all anxious and tense and stuff. I mean, putting stress on yourself as far as learning something new. It could be stress on your mind. It could be pushing your limits as far as things that you were scared to do. And you went and did anyway, being that that thing was not going to kill you and it's fairly safe. But things that might seem really dangerous in your mind, like maybe you want to become a pro landscape photographer, or maybe you just want to photograph all these locations that you see online. And you're like, man, I could never do that. So you just back off from it. But if you aim at that thing and constantly go for it, you might cause some stress and strain into your current normal environment. But over time, it'll actually make you stronger. So how I like to look at this is that let's say you have something, we'll just pick one specific thing. Let's say you want to get better at photography, for example. Well, at first, if you're constantly pushing yourself, you're going to induce some stress or strain into your life, right? So let's say you're down here at point zero and you're like, I want to get better at photography. You might not have an end goal in mind, but maybe you have to constantly put out new work and show it online. Maybe you have to constantly edit photos and fail, but consistently get better over time. All these things cause some mental stress and strain, but once you get used to that mental stress and strain, you're kind of like, oh, well, it's just a feeling. I don't really need to worry about it. So you can kind of push past it. And every one of these experiences kind of just trains your mind to understand that you can actually trust in yourself and trust that there will always be stress. There will always be anxiety, but you can push past it anyway, because a lot of things that cause that are just mental. They're not actually physically dangerous and they won't actually harm you. So whenever you induce stress and strain into the system, There'll be some stress and strain, and then it's always good to recover, right? You need a little break. If you constantly produce stress and strain into your life and you never recover, meaning take a break, rest, take a week off and go do something unrelated, then you'll just burn out. So induce stress or strain into the system, being yourself, your mind, your body, anything else that you want to do in life. And then slowly recover for a short amount of time and then induce more stress and strain into the system. And slowly, your skills will also improve as well because just like weightlifting, I'm gonna put this over here because it meters the camera really dark. Just like weightlifting, at first, you're fairly weak. Most of us are really weak unless we lift or do push-ups or anything else, right? And over time, if you lift with the right methodology or even if you started once a day with one push-up, and you did one push-up every day for a week. Then the next week you did two push-ups every day for a week, then three push-ups every day. Slowly, the one push-up wouldn't seem like much because you were just used to it. It was steady state, it was baseline. So by constantly inducing slight stressors or strain into the system, it will constantly make us stronger so long as there are things that don't kill us and there are things that we can recover from. So. Whenever I'm looking at art or creativity or photography, 
I always want to pick things that I'm really excited to work on and that I think will bring me a long-term return in the future. Like five years out, I'll still be excited to work on this thing or 10 years out. But I'm also aiming for things that make me really uncomfortable, that I know I can induce stress into my own mental and physical system and that will make me stronger over time. And by constantly doing that, I know that even if I fail at a lot of these things that I go after, I still learn something during the process because I taught my body and my mind to be mentally stronger and mentally better suited to deal with stress and strain. And eventually, you might see people that just do things that look like they would be really stressful to you or that you couldn't manage. And this was me when I used to watch YouTube videos, right? I would see people make videos and I would be like, well, I'm nervous to make videos. I don't wanna make videos but I do want to get the ideas out there. So I had this goal of making YouTube videos, but it was stressful for me to make the videos at first. But eventually you just get used to it. And then eventually that stress subsides completely. Whereas to now I can turn on a camera and speak and it doesn't really make me stressed at all because if you really think about it, I'm just talking to a camera out in my gear shed and there's nobody else here. So it's not a big deal. And Anything can be like this, anything that freaks us out, anything that makes us uncomfortable. If we aim for it and pinpoint it down, then it can be something that really helps us to get better with our skills, with our mindset, with our physical ability to do stuff we want and everything else. So this concept of anti-fragile, I try to look for all places in my life that I can apply it. And if I can't apply it, meaning if the system won't get better from stress or strain or my process of photography or my process of creativity won't get better from stress or strain, I normally don't do things like that because that means I won't get a very big return on it in the long term because it's never going to grow. It's never going to get better and I'm never going to be able to improve upon it. Another really good way to visualize things that has helped me a lot in doing tasks that stress me out at first or having goals or objectives or whatever else you want to call it that can be very stressful is to look at the worst case scenarios and the best case scenarios. And this is like the upsides and the downsides. So I can give an example of when I quit my job. I had a good job. I was doing engineering for Boeing, which is a massive airline company. And I kind of liked the job sometimes and I didn't like it other times, but I wanted to be on my own and create photography and art and go backpacking full time and teach people. So I was thinking to myself, well, if I quit my job and I go to be a full time photographer, what is the worst thing that could happen in that scenario? Well, the worst thing that could happen is that I could completely fail at photography. My business wouldn't make any money and I would be broke for a short amount of time, but I could go back and work the same job that I was working before or find a new job in that field that I was qualified for. So the worst case scenario by taking this thing that seemed really risky to me at the time was just being back where I was in the first place, which is at my job that I didn't like that much. So that was the worst case scenario. The best case scenario was I could jump into full-time photography I would get to go on backpacking trips all the time. I would get to take photos all the time. I get to teach and make videos all the time. All things that made me really excited. And the upsides or the best possible outcomes were virtually unlimited because there's no stop on my ability to constantly improve with myself and create and get better. So I might have these ideas right now of all these perfect upsides or these perfect outcomes. But the truth is, if I'm constantly working on my photography and working on myself and going towards uncomfortable situations, then things that I see as the best case scenario right now, I can't see beyond them. Meaning there's all these things that actually could happen. Let's say a good way of putting this would be things that I can see as the best case scenario now once I get to the, that place in like maybe three or five years, there'll be all these new things that open up as far as what I could do. So I can't even see all the potential upsides. Potential downside, 
is being at my old job where I was. Potential upside is virtually infinite or unlimited. So if I see a system or a game like that where there's limited negative downsides, there's unlimited potential upsides, and it's something I'm interested in, but it just makes me uncomfortable, then I'm insane if I say, well, I'm not going to do this because it makes me uncomfortable in the current moment. And I'm just going to go for it anyway. But the hard part is learning to jump past that initial flinch where you have the idea and you're like, ah, I'm not doing that. It's scary. It'll be hard. It will feel uncomfortable. And I think this mindset or ideology almost that we should avoid being uncomfortable at all times is like a disease because it can get into the mind or a virus even maybe. It can get into the mind and completely take over that mind to the point where the mind is looking at all the situations that are going on and constantly trying to be in the most comfortable situation. And I think that can really take us away from being the most prolific creators that we could possibly be. And I can think of many times that I've actually done that and I've seen an uncomfortable scenario and I've backed off into comfort. It actually just makes me feel really bad about myself and I lose self-trust and self-worth. But if I'm always going for things that make me uncomfortable and then I go and do them, sometimes I'll fail, of course, and then I'll know what it was like to fail and I'll learn a lot from that. But sometimes I'll succeed. And either way, I'm learning a lot about myself and how I can learn more and get better. But most of all, I'm gaining trust in myself with the ability to have a goal or have an objective or an outcome and go and accomplish it just by learning things. And the internet is an unbelievable tool because almost anything you want to learn to like a beginner or intermediate skill level, you can just go on the internet and learn to experiment on your own and teach yourself these things. So it's an unbelievable time in history that we have to do this stuff. And I think aiming for comfort and aiming for a mind that is just kind of mellowed out and always comfortable can be a really bad thing. So I always like to turn it up in my mind to the point where I'm like, ah, there's something I want to do. It's going to be uncomfortable. Let's turn that scenario up to even more discomfort and even a higher objective, a more difficult objective and go at it anyway. And those end up being the times in my life that I feel most fulfilled. I feel the happiest. I feel the most rewarded and overall just I feel great when I do that stuff. But I think it's key with this anti-fragile mindset. You always have to be able to recover because if you go into constant stressful situations, I don't know if there's any military soldiers out there watching this stuff. If there are, man, I really appreciate what you guys do. And I don't know what it's like to have PTSD, but if you're constantly under stress and anxiety and you don't or you aren't able to control the situation and really bad things happen without recovery or time to have a break from that, I think that's where PTSD comes from. I'm not a psychologist by any chance, so this could be completely wrong. But I think if you're able to put yourself into controlled situations that do scare you and stress you out, but don't really have the effect of death on the other end, and then take a break and recover, and then go at it again, I think that can be a great way to live life. But if you never have time to recover or you could actually die or you don't have the ultimate control over the scenario or your life, then I think that can cause a lot of mental havoc. So I by no means with this anti-fragile mindset mean put yourself into dangerous scenarios that could actually hurt you, but put yourself into scenarios that make you flinch for a second and you're thinking, oh, well, that's scary in my mind or I don't think my body could actually do that because I've never done it before. I think scenarios like that where you can prove to yourself how valuable or maybe not how valuable, but what you can actually do when you put your mind to it are fantastic. So that's just some of the stuff I wanted to go over. Um, a few of the things that you can really help or at least have really helped me to improve upon with this stuff is number one, do things every day that make you flinch. There's a really good book called Flinch that's all about this. It, that's the entire title of the book. It's called Flinch. I don't know who wrote it. I'll put it down in the, uh, the description under this video. But 
few things you can do to battle this and to make sure that you don't have to think every time. Because if I have to wake up and think every day about doing a bunch of different tasks and all of them are kind of stressful because I haven't done them before, then I'll kind of back off from it. But if I have a schedule where I've already determined that I'm gonna do these tasks and I just get up and I have the schedule set out every day, then I just make the decision once that I'm gonna do it and I don't have to battle my mind every single day. I just wake up and get after it. So The War of Art is an awesome book that discusses this and he calls this thing the resistance. And the resistance is basically when you have this idea in your head of things you're gonna do, things you're gonna create, uh, things you wanna accomplish, and then you're like, nah. The resistance tries to pull you back to your current steady state. So The War of Art is awesome for that. But having a daily schedule where you say, for a block of time every day, I'm gonna do so and so. So let's say you wanted to get better at editing. Set an hour every day where you wake up and you edit for an hour. Don't have an outcome that you could per se fail at every month. Like I'm gonna put out 20 new images a month. Just say, I'm gonna edit for an hour every day. We'll see what it comes out of it every month because you will get good outcomes. Or I'm gonna go on a photo trip once a week where I go out and shoot for a few hours or something like that. And if you make these scenarios where you can actually thrive in this scenario without having like, well, I have to make 10 photos this year that are great. By having the time block or the ecosystem where you can create and not have to have the stress of, I have to make 10 great photos this year, that's the places that I am the best at creating. So that's one thing that can help. You have these blocked times every week or every day that you just create within that time. And what are some other things I wrote down here? Sharing your work online consistently. And I'm a big fan of this because when you have to share your work with other people, even though you currently think your work is bad, it's going to build up your ability to do something that makes you uncomfortable. That is share work that you currently think is bad and not to your full potential with the entire internet. And every time I post a video, I do this. I can even think back on this video already and I've made mistakes while I talk. So it's not perfection, but I'm getting the idea out there and I'm gonna go edit this video and upload it to YouTube after I'm done, even though it has mistakes in it. So sharing things with the world consistently, like photos, videos, anything else you create, even though it's not perfect, will really build up your ability to do uncomfortable things. Another great way to kind of temper yourself to doing uncomfortable things is endurance training, such as long distance hiking, long distance running, or anything else where you're having to constantly push your body to its limits and then recover, of course. And by long distance, I don't mean that you have to go out and run 100 miles or even 30 miles or 50 miles. If you've never run before, run more this week than you did last week. And then the next week after that, run more than you did the previous week. And the next week after that, build upon that. So long as you're constantly pushing yourself out of comfort and out of steady state, I think it could be a huge help. Another way that I get myself going in the morning, if I'm just like, dude, I don't wanna do it today, is one of two things. If you don't have access to cold water, like a lake that's really cold or a mountain stream, then you can just take a really cold shower and just stand under the shower as it's cold until it doesn't become cold anymore. And at first you're going to flinch because you don't wanna get in the cold. Just step in the shower. And then after you do that, you'll just sit there and you're gonna be like, ah, probably screaming way louder than that. And then you notice that the shower is no longer cold after about two minutes. And you're like, oh, I could just sit in this water all day. It's not actually gonna hurt you because the water's probably like 50 degrees or something like that. But you'll notice these flinch instincts everywhere in your life. And when you see them, you'll learn to point them out. And then when you see them every day as you try to create, you'll be like, oh, that's just my mind trying to put me back in the comfort zone. I know where to aim now. I'm gonna go right at that thing that made me flinch. And if it's something that I wanna do, I'm gonna go directly at it over the long term, and I'm gonna have that step-by-step -step daily schedule to make sure I show up and accomplish what I wanna do. So hopefully that'll help you guys out. These are always skills that I'm trying to refine, but it's also a mindset that makes me extremely excited to teach about. All right, so let's get to the Q&A for this week with some of the questions that you guys had over this past week. So if you guys are a subscriber to my channel, 
you can leave questions under any of the videos and I will pick the top rated ones to answer in this Sunday Q&A video. So make sure you're a subscriber first, hit the subscribe button and then that bell next to it and you'll always get notifications when I put out videos. And then if you like this video, if you got something useful from it, hit the thumbs up button and that helps me to be able to teach more people, to share with my knowledge with more people and overall that's my goal. So here are the videos or the questions I should say from this week. Number one was somebody asked me to do a gear loadout for my winter trips, meaning they wanted to see all the backpacking and camera gear that I take out on one of my winter trips. And if you guys are interested in that, let me know under this video and I can make a video like that in the future. So number one question, it was from Howard Thompson. And Howard says, several weeks in the wilderness and shooting picks requires batteries, which can get heavy. How do you recharge them in the middle of nowhere? So. There's a few different ways you can go into this. And I've talked about this before. Number one, people always like to ask, well, why don't you carry a solar charger? Well, a solar charger is pretty heavy and it doesn't guarantee you charge unless you have sunlight. So unless your trip's like 15 plus days, you could probably carry like five or eight extra batteries for the weight of the solar charger. And it doesn't even give you a guarantee. The batteries I use for the Z7 and the Nikon D810 are in EL15 batteries, and they're about an ounce and a half each. So I just carry a battery for my camera for every day of the trip. And now with the Z7, which I'm recording on right now, it actually has a USB-C plug. So I can recharge it from those big battery bricks. I'll grab one real quick. So here's one of the bricks that I use. It's just an anchor power brick. It's got USBs right here and then a USB micro. So you could plug any USB in here. This will charge the Z7 batteries or the EL15 batteries. About four batteries will be charged with one of these bricks. And then there's like a half size brick you can also get if you have a shorter trip. So I normally take one battery for each day of the trip. So I'll take three EL15 camera batteries and then for every extra four days of the trip, I'll take one of these because I know I can charge four of those batteries with this. You could also just take a single battery for each day of the trip. And the good reason to do that is because any other method such as solar might fail on you. It's just another failure mode in your system for charging batteries. And it also has a lot of weight that comes with it that you have to calculate when you're looking at batteries. So I'd rather just keep it simple and use batteries and then use these. This also charges my GoPro and my phone that I use for navigation and everything else. And one of these actually weighs less than four ENEL15 batteries, but will charge for those batteries. So this is a more efficient mode of carrying energy out in the field, but I still carry three of the ENEL15 batteries because I wanna have the ability to swap them out if one dies for some reason or another. Another reason that I like to do that is um, Whenever you're out shooting in the field, you might get one of the batteries wet or it might fail or anything else. And you want to have two backup just in case. So I carry three out with me plus one of these. Another thing you can really do to help improve your battery life in your camera is to take it out when you're not shooting. So I have my camera packed away in my bag when I'm out hiking and I take the battery out before I put it back. And that will help it to last a lot longer. So the next question is, so that was from Howard Thompson. Thanks for the question, Howard. Really appreciate it. The next question is from Andy Blessett. I think that's how you say your name. It says, I live in the UK and will never see or meet the things that you do. What I'm keen to know is, how do you deal with the wildlife you must come across? So the wildlife, the bear, the cougar, the wolf questions, I get these all the time. And from the outside, before you start going out in the wild, and when you first do, this seems like these things are just waiting to attack and eat you at any possible time they can, right? But what I found, and of course you will always take all accountability and all everything onto your own shoulders when you're out in the wilderness, but what I found is that none of these animals are dangerous. The only animal that I'm really even semi-worried about is the grizzly bear. And when I go into grizzly bear territory, I'll carry bear spray. 
Otherwise, I don't carry any deterrent. I don't carry any firearms when I go out backpacking because they weigh a lot. I'm not against having a firearm in my vehicle or at my house, but firearms are not a great way to protect yourself when you're out backpacking because they're so heavy and you don't want to have to carry a firearm around on your trip. And most places like parks, you can't even carry a firearm. So the best thing to do that I found for wild animals is first determine the animals where you're going that are above the food chain from you. So where I go in the Western US, Canada, BC, up in Alaska, the grizzlies number one, but most places don't have grizzlies except Alaska, Montana. They say they have them in Eastern Washington. And I don't know if that's the case or not. And they say they have them in Wyoming. I don't know if that's the case anymore or not either, but definitely Montana is pretty big grizzly territory, Idaho maybe as well. But if I'm not in grizzly territory, I want to look at all the other animals that could hurt me. Number one, bears could hurt you, black bear, brown bear. Number two, cougars or mountain lions. Now, it's always good to know what to do if you get attacked by one of these animals. And you don't need to just know what to do. You need to understand the entire process of what to do until it's ingrained into your muscle memory. For example, if you see a bear on the trail, you need to know exactly what to do when you encounter that bear without even thinking. If the bear runs at you and attacks you, you also need to know exactly what to do. And there's lots of training online. I'm not going to get into the training. You can Google and research what you need to do. But a good thing to do is to go out in your backyard with all your gear on that you would be hiking with and pretend there's a bear and go through the exact step-by-step -step method that you're supposed to go through to make sure it's ingrained in your muscle memory. For cougars, the exact same thing holds true. You need to know the entire process of how to deal with a cougar if you meet it. Most likely in the wild, neither of these things or any other wild animals, even a grizzly, is not going to bother you with you. They would rather be left alone so long as you're making noise and you don't sneak up on them then they want to stay as far away as possible as you to make sure that you don't come after them, right? Because they don't know if you're a hunter. They don't know if you're something that's trying to eat or kill them. They just see a big person. And if they're familiar with people, they probably also know that that's not the best thing to kill to get some food. So usually the only time that a cougar or a bear is going to attack you is if it's frightened from being cornered and it can't escape. If it's threatened, if it has cubs or babies with it, then it might attack you to save them. Or it's extremely hungry, usually from being injured and has no way else to get food. So you're like the last ditch effort. Cougars and bears generally aren't looking for people to eat. That's not their main source of food. They would rather find something that they're used to eating and that they have evolved to eat. So these things can all be threats. They can definitely hurt you. But a much bigger chance of getting hurt or dying is in your car on the way to the trailhead. And nobody ever thinks about this because it's become normalized. They'll pick up their phone and text on the way to the trailhead. And the statistical spike as they drive to the trailhead, the chance for death is way up. Once they get to the trailhead and start hiking out in the backcountry, even with all these so-called dangerous things like falling off a cliff or bears or wildlife, the chances of you getting harmed from them, even in the worst case scenario, are so low compared to the chances of you getting sick with like a terminal illness, a car accident, or anything else that kills millions and millions of people every year. So it's always good to look at the statistical chances of things actually happening to kind of rate the level of fear that you should have around them. And it's good to be trained to what to do if you come in contact with those things. Because if you're not trained on what to do, you're going to make a guess and that's where you're going to get hurt. So Extensive training is fantastic. I have training for anything that I get into that's of a very high skill level, meaning if you go backpacking, you want to get trained in all the things that can kill you. So be trained in wild animal response. Be trained as a wilderness first responder, meaning that if you're in a scenario that needs medical attention, you have to know, and by know, I mean thoroughly understand how to extract yourself from a severe medical you could say trauma or any other accident and being able to extract others as well. So the wilderness first responder training, which anyone can get, it's a 10 day course. You will know how to react to these scenarios so you can be better prepared. For mountain climbing, using ropes, 
using crampons, using harnesses, surviving up in the mountains in very dire environments. These are all things you can get trained upon. You can train for avalanche safety, how to survive in avalanche terrain, how to make the best decisions. And training is also just going to be a great method to expand your ability to help other people as well if they get into a bad scenario. So these are all things I want to be ready for. I want to be ready to take care of people, help them out of bad situations if they need it. But I don't want to be scared of things and let them hinder the things I actually want to do in life if those things aren't actually that high a probability of me getting hurt. And even if they are, once I know the probability, I can kind of weigh that against what's going on. So I like wilderness photography and being in the outdoors because I'm dealing with all these things that could potentially get dangerous really quick. I'm kind of walking this fine line between safety and danger, but I am always trained on all the things, at least the things that I think could happen. So I could kind of extract myself out of that situation. So that's kind of a long answer to your question, but I think all these things tie together. Any way you can be more prepared as far as training for anything, and actually take the time to ingrain that training into your muscle memory because I've been in some emergency scenarios and in emergency scenarios, the best thing to be able to do, which takes time at first, is stop, take a few deep breaths, meaning like one or two deep breaths and decide on the next thing to do because if you can't train yourself to stop and go, In a lot of circumstances, if you don't do that first, you'll make a really bad decision because you can't snap out of it and kind of deal with the chaos that's coming around. Now, sometimes there's not time to take two deep breaths. Like if you're a cop and you pull up on a murder scene and somebody tries to take you out, you can't take two deep breaths. So you need to be really trained. If you come across a wild animal on the trail, you can probably take a second to collect yourself and take one deep breath and say, there's no need to be scared. Being scared is not going to help me in this situation. Being scared will draw the animal to me as I show fear. I need to make logical decisions based on my training that aren't fear-based. And that's the best way out. But it takes a lot of time and a lot of repetition to train yourself to not make fear-based decisions. And I think that's one of the biggest assets that you can have as a person is to be able to step back from your mental thoughts and fear and say, I need to make the logical decision, but not a decision based on fear. So that all plays into that stuff. Hopefully it helps you out. I thank you guys for watching this video. I really have fun doing these. I'm going on a trip tomorrow, so I might be posting a video on Wednesday. I was going to try to get it edited because I already have it ready, but we'll see if I get it done or not. For anybody that's on my email list, I'm going to send you guys some new content on Wednesday no matter what. So if you're not on my email list, you can sign up for it below this video. There's a link and you get access to my free photography course and a bunch of PDF guides that you can take out shooting with you. So once again, guys, thanks for watching. I appreciate you being here. Hit the subscribe and like button if you enjoyed this video. I'll see you next time.